Okay, done, buttons pressed, we're on. Hi, how are you? And welcome along to episode, do I have this right? Is it 32? Episode 32 of uh, Shelf Analysis. If this is the first one you're watching, there is a load more you can look back at. Uh, you can find them wherever you're watching this. If you're watching live now in the Ricochet Book Club, they're all in the announcement section. You'll find it there. Of course, everything is archived on the show's YouTube channel as well. How do you find it? Either just stick my name in or stick Shelf Analysis in to YouTube and you'll find all of the previous episodes there as well. And if you're watching much, much, much later on RTE Culture, how are you? Uh, and also, you'll be able to find all of the previous episodes of this on the uh, YouTube channel and on RTE Culture as well. Um, welcome along for tonight and for what is a glorious, wonderful, sunny... No, you've no time to look at the bookshelves behind. Stop paying attention to the bookshelves. Pay attention to me. Pay attention to me. After we did this, and I think the, the, the one we did with David Mitchell um, last week was the first one from here, which is the box room upstairs in the house, which has currently been converted into my wife's office, which is... I'm, I'm, leaning on her desk um here um so that was the first one we'd um done from here why because right away yeah i'm pointing in the right direction because there's sunlight outside and because you can see me this isn't important now this will become important in the context of what i'm about to tell you when it comes to tonight's guest uh, john irving is the guest tonight but this is the first of the pre-recorded ones uh, that we've done we had to pre-record it both in, in terms of the time difference and in terms of trying to work around his working day um, so we did the interview last week. It's top notch. That's coming in a few minutes. Um, usual bits and pieces I need to catch you up on. First of all, let me see. I'm going to do this. Yeah, first things are first, which is this one here. I want to give you a heads up on this, partially because I'm involved. This is happening tomorrow night. Normally, Maynooth University would have an alumni gathering around this time uh, every year. And it would normally happen physically in the College of Maynooth University. Of course, nobody's doing that kind of thing these days. Uh, this year, they have hired uh, yours truly to be the uh, link together for all of the events that are happening as part of a virtual one. It's happening tomorrow night. It is for everybody. You do not have to be an alumni or a student at Maynooth University. You just have to like your arts and culture. So this is happening tomorrow night. Have a look at the uh, link, which is there, no, there. Uh, mu.ie forward slash together apart. All of the details are there. It's an hour long event in which you have dance, you have poetry, uh, you have authors, you have playwrights, there's a little philosophy in there as well, and then the keynote speaker is Ejit Tamel Karan, who I've raved on about many, many times um, about her books uh, in recent years. And Griffin is part of it as well, Fella Speaks is part of it, there's a whole other thing, it's all, all happening as part of that. Um, you'll find the details there, nu.ie forward slash together apart, that's at eight o'clock tomorrow night, in case you're knocking around. Now, I've done my bits for that uh, already. And the reason I wanted to tell you that is I want to show you this. Did I stick this in last? I did. I put it in here. Sorry, this is not really very good. It's not, there you go. So while I was in the process of recording all of the bits and pieces that I needed for that particular uh, event, Liz took this picture, which essentially is me where I am right now. So this is me pointing towards the... And behind me are all of the bookshelves. So it gives you an idea of the scale of the room that I'm in and how pretty much half of it is taken up by the enormous bookshelves uh, behind you. I will, I'll give you a look at what's in them um, at some stage, uh, some night. It was the weirdest thing in the world um, doing something like that, primarily because you realize this is now entirely the new normal. I now have half of my job, which if I'd been doing that event would have been on stage and in front of a big crowd of people in a university being done in my box room. Fair enough. Um, I want to do two things. Firstly, I'm going to go to Karina. Uh, Karina is, of course, our show houseplant. Uh, Karina is reading something brand new every week that she thinks you should be reading as well. Karina, where are you and what are you reading? Karina, how are you? How's it going? Is all well? Yeah, okay. You could get a little bit more animated as the weeks go on. It's fine. Could you bring a hair dryer in? No. Okay, that's close enough. Uh, you are reading, of course, Christine Dwyer Hickey's The Narrow Land, which has uh, been on the shelf downstairs for quite some time as well. It was last weekend uh, the winner of the inaugural novel of the year at the Dawkey Literary Awards. Now, normally the Dawkey Book Festival will be happening around this time of year. Normally, I would have been out there with everybody else and involved in doing interviews and uh, talking to people. Uh, of course, that all went by the wayside this year as well but I was part of the judging panel for the awards this year. The novel of the year went to that, to Christine Dwyer, uh, The Narrow Land, and deservedly so. Thank you, Karina. Thank you. Talk to you later. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. No, you hang up. Okay. No. Um, what I did want to play to you, in case you haven't seen it, is this. I was the chair of the judging panel 
for the uh, Emerging Writer Award, it's what it's called. So there were two awards this year, uh, a 20,000 euro prize for the novel of the year, the Emerging Writer gets 10,000 euro. Um, you may have seen a clip of this that they used last Saturday night. This is a slightly longer version. Um, the winner was Sinead Gleason for Constellations. And what we had arranged to do was to have me do a Zoom call with Sinead ostensibly to talk to her about being nominated and how she felt about that and how excited she was about the upcoming ceremony. Of course, that was nonsense. I was only talking to Sinead and we were telling Sinead online that she had won this year's prize. Sinead knew nothing about this in advance. And I just would like you to see the moment when she realizes that she's won the prize. It's the first time I've done one of these as well. So slightly fiddly, but check this out and have a look. I'm gonna play you this. And I'm going to play um, this. Then as the chair of the judging panel, it was the unanimous decision of the uh, judges this year to award you the prize. And Constellations is the winner of Emerging Writer for 2020 at the Dolphy Literary Awards. What? Hold on a second, I thought we were doing an interview. That's not what's happening here. You're the winner, congratulations, Sinead. Oh my God. Oh my God, Rick, I didn't, oh my God, I'm absolutely, I'm totally thrilled. I'm just really thrilled. That's unbelievable. Thank it you. It would have taken the fun out of this if I'd said anything to you in advance. That's the whole idea. Oh my God, I just, oh, you're so sneaky. Sure, <laughs> <laughs> put myself up before that happens again. I am very sneaky. Just be aware if I'm ever due to have a conversation with you about anything that it might not necessarily be what it's about. Um, that was Sinead Gleeson winning the Emerging Writer Award for the inaugural Dorky Literary Awards, uh, which happened over the weekend. If you go and have a look at their website, you'll find this elongated of um, versions of both of those. And you'll find out about the, the uh, shortlists on both of them uh, as well. Is there anything else I need to talk to you about? I don't think so. No, I think that's it. I think I'm done for now. So a couple of things to explain to you. Um, Again, this is the first one of these we've ever had to record in 32 uh, episodes. Normally, whenever I'm talking to somebody, and you'll have seen it, particularly, uh, you know, if it was the likes of David Mitchell last week, where, you know, he dropped in and out a few times in terms of his uh, his, his uh, ability to, to, to get his Wi-Fi working. Um, these shows are very, very, very live. Um, because uh, he lives in Canada and because we were working around his writing schedule, the only time I could talk to John Irving was uh, this time last week, roughly. Um, it's the same room. It's the same me. He has an immaculate camera. He looks absolutely fantastic. And this is a great interview and I hope you enjoy it very much. Just be aware, the further along the interview goes, the darker it gets in this room because we recorded the interview at nine o'clock at night. And then a thunderstorm happened outside here, which meant the whole room got immediately dark. There's nothing I can do. I'm in the middle of interviewing John Irving. I can't exactly go and turn the light on. So I get slightly darker. You don't need to really see me. All you need to do is to see um, John Irving. I hope you enjoy this. Uh, this is me talking to the great man. Uh, this time last week, not that one, this one, there you go. Not that one, press the right button. There we go, that's what I'm looking for. I get good at this one of these days. Enjoy John Irving. John Irving from uh, from your home, welcome to Shelf Analysis and thank you so much for taking the time to, to be part of the program tonight. Thank you for asking me, happy to be here. Not even slightly. We've just caught you at the, the very end of your work day, if, I, if I'm right, so so you've been been writing throughout the course of, of, of the day? Yes, I, I, I work all day. It's, it's for, for someone who wasn't uh, able to be a full-time writer until my fourth book, um, I, I, I have a kind of child's gratitude for what still feels like a new gift to me that I am self-supporting as a writer and can therefore write all day. I used to complain bitterly for the writing of my first four novels that I was coaching wrestling, teaching English. Um, I didn't dislike doing those things. Um, but I wanted to write seven, eight hours a day. And, um, and it, it, it took a while in my writing career to, um, uh, to make that possible. And I, I feel kind of grateful for it every day. 
And so, so do you, and I know many authors who would use this phraseology, do you treat it as if it is a job? You show up at first thing in the morning, you write for X period of time, and then that's, that's your work day complete. Well, I don't, I, I don't, I see, when you say treat it as a job, I, I, I feel it, 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 it still feels like an unexpected luxury to me that I get to support myself by something uh, I've always loved to do since I was a young teenager and, and always dreamed that I would be given more time to do it. Um, and, uh, and so it, it, it worked out. It doesn't feel like a job or, um, but I am, I, I, I'm a somewhat driven person and I, um, uh, physical exercise, physical training, kind of coincidentally uh, um, entered my life about the same time that starting to write um, uh, uh, also sort of uh, came to me. Um, and, and so I don't consider those things a, 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 a burden or even a discipline. A discipline is, makes it sound like something you have to uh, force yourself to do. Um, I love to do it. So maybe just briefly then, before I, I ask you about the new, about the, the upcoming novel, which I'm, I haven't really seen you talk about an, anywhere before. The last, uh, and one of the reasons this series came about was because there were authors who were locked down, they were at home, and this series was created as a result of wanting to talk to authors about, about their work and about books that they had that were upcoming. For the last eight weeks, nine weeks, ten weeks, uh, how, how has your life been personally? How, how has life differed for you, if, if at all? Well, if this goes on for another eight or nine months, um, uh, I, I think I'll be as, as restless and, and stir crazy as anyone else. But, but the coincidence of uh, this self-isolation in my life was was rather fortuitously timed. It, it comes as I'm finishing a novel. It comes as I'm writing the final chapters of the novel, now going on four years. And I would be, in essence, self-isolating as much as I could at this time in my normal life as a writer, this being a 15th novel. So uh, I, I, I feel somewhat guilty uh, that um, uh, this self-isolation has, has kind of come at a moment that serves me well and my wife and daughter are taking care of me and I, um, I have uh, uh, a ninth and tenth floor uh, apartment in a midtown uh, Toronto uh, uh, condo and I have not left the ninth or 10th floors since the 15th of March. Um, I have in my workspace enough gym equipment to make me happy. There are balconies um, uh, so I can uh, occasionally work outside or, or at least um, uh, sit and read outside and get some uh, fresh air, but I'm, uh, with the help of my wife and daughter, I'm, I'm kind of self-sufficient to uh, stay put. Well then, maybe tell us a, a little bit about, about that novel, about Darkness as a Bride. It is your 15th novel. It's so, uh, as and of yet, not really spoken about that you can't even find a, a cover for the book anywhere on the internet, despite the fact that it's coming out later this year. So what can you tell us about the, about the new novel? Well, it's... Um, uh, to readers familiar uh, uh, to my novels, it it it, it uh, there is a uh, once again a um, a mother and son uh, uh, relationship. Um, uh, there is uh, a boy growing up without a, um, a a visible or actual biological father. Um, uh, whose um, mother's um, 
uh, life remains as somewhat uh, uh, of a of a mystery. She was um, uh, a slalom racer, uh, a competitive skier. Um, never made it in competition, but she was um, good enough to be in competition. Um, and the boy has always felt a, a resentment uh, to skiing and her skiing uh, because she was always away uh, in the winter months and he, he willfully, uh, as, as hard as she tries to teach him to ski, he um, uh, resists uh, learning and until uh, there's a time in his life when uh, he wishes he had l learned how uh, to ski uh, a little better, but but um, uh, there's there's a time when you should learn to do those things, and 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 so it 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 uh, it it passes. It's also a portrait of an artist novel. It's about a a boy who grows up to be a um, uh, a writer who gets to be what. Uh, he hopes to be, um, and, and not without um, uh, some difficulty. Uh, uh, but it's um, uh, principally, um, even though for pages and pages at a time, they're very much in the background, um, it's a ghost story. Um, and um, uh, the boy is introduced to some of the spirit to haunt his mother at a fairly uh, early age, but he is given the feeling from her that um, that um, there are people who see them and people who don't, and he will be one of those people who does. He is. Um, and 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 so um, uh, uh, the ghosts are not new uh, to my readers. There've been characters who've become uh, ghosts before. There've been uh, um, uh, uh, spiritual moments in um, in my novels before, but they're kind of uh, very much. Um, in the forefront early in this novel and then as ghosts do they disappear for a while but we know they'll be back um and 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 so it's um it, it's a novel about a, a character who ultimately has to come to terms with his ghosts actual ghosts in this case but ghosts also in the sense of um his own uh, willful uh, bad habits, which um, will haunt him. It sounds exceptional, and it's something to look forward to um, for, for for later this year. There's, there's obviously going to be an enormous amount of books coming out in the, in, in the tail end of, of 2020. Um, ostensibly, the reason that we talk to authors on this program is to have them perhaps suggest some books to us that maybe might be worth reading now books from any time books from any place they can be old new fiction non-fiction uh, and you've been thinking about that for for a little while so what have you come up with that that you think people should be reading right now well i've um i i've i've uh, talked a lot uh, in the past about those 19th century novels which um made me want to be a writer, a writer of that 19th century kind, uh, not a contemporary writer or even a modern writer, but a novel, a novel is very much in the vein of that uh, 19th century uh, narrative, um, plotted, character-driven uh, story kind, Dickens, uh, Hardy, and many writers in translation, Thomas Mann, um, Flaubert. Um, my fellow Americans have, have been somewhat less impressive to me, with the exception of a, a, a couple of uh, old New Englanders, um, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne and, and Herman Melville. Moby Dick is, is a novel I read every couple of years. Um, 
it usually happens that I go back looking for a chapter or a piece. And once I uh, find what I'm looking for, I go back and read uh, the whole thing again. It is um, for all of its um, sprawl um, and uh, seemingly, seemingly episodic nature. Um, uh, it is uh, a novel with an ending that has been uh, superbly crafted into the early chapters um, of the novel. You know, he knows what's going to happen. Um, and that sense of foreshadow is, is empowering um, to, to me um, uh, very. So um, I'm always reading or rereading um, a Dickens novel. I'm always uh, uh, rereading um, uh, Moby Dick. But um, uh, I share with a couple of uh, close friends, old friends, uh, and um, uh, contemporaries of, of mine um, uh, here in Canada, Michael Landace, um, and in New York, Edmund White. Um, I, I, I share with them that, that something that fellow contemporary authors like, I think, quite as much as we do, which, which is the, the intermixing of um, uh, novels that have uh, uh, some autobiographical um, elements, um, which uh, change or get manipulated or, over various books, but novels that also entail learning about something else, learning about something new, learning about something quite outside or beyond uh, the author's autobiographical experience. I don't know of a couple of other contemporary writers like Edmund and Michael who, who enjoy research uh, as much as, um, as, as, uh, uh, as I do. I loved the most recent uh, Andace novel, Warlight, um, which has um, uh, some bearing, uh, some, uh, not as much perhaps as Cat's Table, but um, is, is some bearing to Michael's own life, but, but is um, a, a fantastically evoked um, uh, London at the time of the war uh, novel. I love that novel. Um, uh, one of my most recent uh, favorites. And there's a novel forthcoming from Edmund, um, uh, which is called A Saint from Texas. Um, all by itself, such an unlikely thing. It's a wonderful title. Um, uh, but it's a novel about uh, uh, two uh, lesbian twins, as only um, Edmund White would be um, mischievous and daring enough, I think, to uh, conceive. And uh, they're um, uh, women of very different uh, natures. Um, uh, aside from their uh, uh, sexual orientation. Um, but the novel also includes the, an explanation of, of, um, uh, of how someone gets to be uh, declared a saint. Uh, there are rules for sainthood, which um, I never knew, and never knew that Edmund had taken the trouble to teach himself. Um, so it, it, th there really is um, uh, a character who um, uh, becomes a saint. Uh, uh, so those are, those are two of my favorite uh, contemporaries. Um, I read the Edmund White in, in galleys. It won't be published for um, a short while hence. That's always good to have something to look forward to. Research is an interesting question, though, and I did ask prior to this, um, we asked people to submit questions for you if, 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 if they were interested in doing it. Kevin uh, did. Thank you, Kevin. He was interested in you finding the inspiration for books like The Water Method and The Fourth Hand and about the kind of research that went into books like that. Um, well, th this is... It's embarrassing to say, especially in this format, um, 
but um, th there was actually very little uh, research uh, involved in the water method man because um, I had um, a, a urinary tract uh, surgery um, uh, for a crooked uh, urinary tract, which was at, at, at the time um, most embarrassing and uncomfortable to me. And I imagined how it could come into the time, uh, the, the life of a fictional character at a time which would be even more uncomfortable and embarrassing. So I certainly exaggerated um, bogus Trumper's experience, but um, uh, I didn't have to do any research on that one. Um, uh, that, that was um, a, uh, a necessary surgical correction that, that uh, happened to me. It's interesting that, that um, uh, I'm being credited with a piece of research that was not necessary for me to do. Uh, <laughs> it obviously passed off and looked and sounded yeah, well, like research. Yeah. But, but um, uh, I, trust me, I didn't uh, enter into this willingly. Um, as, as for the fourth hand, um, uh, that entire, uh, uh, that, that did entail a great deal of research, but that, that novel was entirely um, my wife Janet's idea. We were watching the news um, one night on TV bef before we went to bed, and um, um, we were actually we were in bed, um, and um, I was almost asleep. But uh, Janet was more interested in the news than I was, and it was about, um, at the time, the first successful hand transplant. Um, and Janet said to me, if, you know, if, if you died, um, I would love to give one of your hands to someone who needed a hand, provided um, that I would be allowed to come um, visit him and and hold his hand because uh, I've always loved your hand. Well then she went to sleep and I was awake all night. I got up and immediately started the fourth hand. Um, it, it, so it, 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 um, it, it was entirely at, up on Janet's uh, inspiration and that did entail um, uh, a lot of work about yeah. things I knew <laughs> nothing about and had no experience <laughs> with. Thankfully. Um, maybe just, just before um, we finish up, I was interested to, to know, I mean, in terms of your, your, your writing process and finding inspiration, is, is it different now than it was, let's say, for instance, when you were writing, you know, novels for five and six? How has that changed over time? Um... The biggest change, Rick, uh, was the writing of those first first four novels, The World According to Garp being the fourth, and uh, the novel that um, uh, uh, gave me sufficient income as a writer to become uh, self-supporting. Um, for the writing of those first four novels, I was lucky if I had... Uh, two hours a day to write and not every day of the week either. Um, and that was because I would get up at, uh, at five and, and, and when uh, uh, the youngest and loudest of my children would wake up, I, I, my day would essentially be um, over. Um, and uh, so I see uh, a real difference uh, after that fourth novel in in having that luxury of the seven and eight hour day. Um, I see that there's a better management of the architecture of the story as a whole. Um, I see um, the uh, benefit of more rewriting as I go instead of writing in a linear direction um, through to the end of the book and then having an 
enormous and cumbersome and often architecturally changing um, rewrite uh, facing me. Uh, the, the kind of things that, um, uh, you know, are, are, are immediately noticeable between writing seven days a week, seven hours a day, and two hours a day, four days a week. Um, so I, you know, um, I, I see a big difference um, uh, along about um, uh, uh, the sixth novel. It took me a while to learn how to put that time in. I was very disappointed with myself when I was writing The Hotel New Hampshire, the novel Aftergarb, because I couldn't, I simply couldn't make myself um, work for eight hours a day. I didn't know how. And it wasn't until The Cider House Rules, uh, the sixth novel, um, when uh, suddenly it was easy. I, I, I had to um, set an alarm clock um, uh, to tell me when to stop and go to the gym. Uh, our time is up. The book is going to be called Darkness as a Bright. It's your 15th novel and it's out later this year. John Irving, it's been absolutely lovely and wonderful and I wish you rude health. And not later see you this year, by, not later this year, but sometime in uh, 2021. And this is even better news, in which case we're talking about it even further in advance of it coming out. Uh, John Irving, <laughs> thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. And as you can see from that, that's the difference between now, 7.30, and the sun shining, and it being almost 10 o'clock at night in the middle of a thunderstorm. Um, that was the wonderful John Irving speaking to me last week from his home in Canada. And that has been tonight's Shelf Analysis. We will have another one for you same time next week, live at 7 o'clock here in the Ricochet Book Club. Or, of course, you can watch all the previous episodes on the YouTube channel. Uh, just look up Shelf Analysis in YouTube and you'll find all the details there. And um, thanks to everybody for watching tonight. I'll catch you on RTE Gold throughout the course of the week as well. And see you here same time next week. Um, till then, have a good one.